And being in Oxford, not in Italy, we're not going to have a 15 minutes academic lateness, so we're going to start short. I'm Andrea Ruggeri, fellow in politics here at Brazenos, but also I'm convening the UNI, United Nations Academic Impact Hub with Oxford, and convening the Conflict Peace Security Hub at Oxford, that is an attempt to coordinate people working on peace, security, and conflict at Oxford. And today, I have the honor to host several amazing speakers, but Rachel will be chairing. So <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Federica, from connecting from New York. And uh, thank you, Richard, from coming from New York. And thank you, Sam, Sam for your, your, your also amazing work for the UNI Oxford Hub. So I'm just going to sit and listen. Uh, this is one of the several events we're doing as a hub. You can find actually a podcast if you're interested in podcasts. Uh, we are, have launched a podcast called Piece of Advice, where we actually interview academics and we try to translate their, their research into practice and possible policy implication. We're gonna we're about to launch actually our website, and our website will have a digest section where we summarize research and books, book for instance by Rich, Richard Kaplan. Uh, and in order to circulate more research ideas about United Nations and peace operation and conflict resolution in the broad public, but also within the United Nations. So uh, if you have any question, if you have any doubt, or if you have any possible idea of collaboration about uh, the hub here at Oxford, feel free to contact me. And uh, I think this is, you know, one amazing, terrific, but also dramatic moment to work on United Nations peace and conflict resolution. So, uh, Rachel, thank you for sharing, and I'm going to see it. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andrea. Um, thank you so much to everybody for joining um, this evening, um, and especially thank you to all of our amazing speakers. Um, I think what's really exciting about all of our speakers is that they work at really the intersection of academia, practice, and policy. And so I think that really brings um, kind of a, a nuanced, like sort of depth, interesting depth to, to a lot of the questions that we'll be discussing today. Um, questions like, in light of the Ukraine war and the kind of um, upset that that poses to the international community, um, and in light of what we know about the structure functionalities and dysfunctionalities of the Security Council, what really are the prospects for reform um, at the United Nations? So to speak, we'll start with Richard, who Richard Gowan, who is the UN Director at the International Crisis Group, um, visiting us from New York, where he engages in advocacy work and uh, liaises with diplomats and UN officials. Previously, the Research Director at New York University Center on International Cooperation, and has taught at Columbia University and Stanford in New York. Um, he has consulted to the UN on peacekeeping, political affairs, and mig migration. So thank you so much for being here. Sam Dawes is a research associate, senior research associate at DPIR here at Oxford. He served as the first officer to the UN Secretary um, General Kofi Annan from 2000 until 2003. He later served as deputy director to the UK cabinet working on the Sustainable Development Goals, and his previous uh, roles included Senior Principal Research Analyst in the Multilateral Policy Directorate um, at, of the FCO, Executive Director of the UN Association of the UK, and UK Representative of the United Nations Foundation. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, we'll hear from Federica D'Alessandra. Thank you so much for joining us from New York, um, where she's advising on the permanent support needed to fulfill international mandates dealing with mass atrocities. She's also the deputy director of the Blavatnik School of Government's Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict. And prior to that, Federica was at Harvard University, where she focused on mass atrocity response, national security, transitional justice and human rights. And she often advises governments and international organizations on those themes. A small logistical note is that we are recording um, the session, including the Q&As, so please do bear that in mind and let me know afterwards if you have any concerns about that. Um, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, and um, thank you to everyone for, I think, making the rather counterintuitive choice of coming to listen to us on uh, such a lovely day. But um, 
uh, clearly, even even the sun cannot deflect you from UN reform. Um, I'm going to sort of give you uh, an update uh, from New York, uh, where I am based, about debates about how to change the UN in the context of Ukraine. Um, as Rachel said, uh, I am the UN director for the International Crisis Group. Uh, crisis Group is a conflict prevention organization. We have 120 colleagues around the world in places, including Ukraine, who do dangerous things, um, like go to the front lines of conflict and try and understand what is happening on the ground. I do not do that. I live in Brooklyn. I get on the subway. I go to the UN and I try and persuade diplomats and UN officials to hear our policy advice about what they should do in conflict situations. But even for me, the last few months have probably been the most intense uh, period of my time working with the UN because we have been focusing flat out on what the UN can do, um, the very limited options that the UN has uh, to help in the Ukrainian situation. And so we've been thinking about very short term questions about what the Secretary General should say when he went to Moscow and to Kiev uh, in April to see Presidents Putin and Zelensky. We've been thinking about what peacekeeping operations the UN could put on the ground in the context of uh, a cease in hostilities. Um, so we're very much focused on the short term, but cutting through our focus on the short term are some bigger questions. And the really big question is, where does this conflict, a conflict in which a member of the permanent five powers has launched um, a huge assault on one of its neighbors, leave the UN? And I think there is a very broad sense in New York that there has to be some sort of reform of the international system to respond to the weaknesses of the system that we have seen um, over the last months. Now, there's an irony here, which was even before the 24th of February, there was a lot of talk about the need to upgrade the UN to deal with other recent crises. And of course, the main focus in recent years has been COVID and the recognition that the international system and the UN system and the World Health Organization did not respond especially effectively to COVID in 2020 and 2021. In uh, the fall of 21, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, released a report called Our Common Agenda. And in Our Common Agenda, he set out a series of ideas about how the international system could respond more effectively to future pandemics. He also talked a lot about climate change and he talked about inequality. What he didn't really talk about was peace and security issues. And it seems that Guterres made a bet last year that what would really be the focus in the coming years would be pandemics, would be climate change, would be economic issues. And actually, he shouldn't focus too much on peace and security. Uh, the report does contain some very weak paragraphs on peace and security issues. I'm happy to say they're very weak because I wrote them. Um, but you know, it was ultimately a bit of a disappointment. Then Ukraine happens, and all of a sudden, we realize that it's impossible to look at the international system without thinking about the future of international peace and security. And there has been an immense focus, both in New York, but more generally on the failings of the Security Council in particular. And we're suddenly hearing a outpouring of ideas about how we should reform the Security Council. Um, now, these ideas cover quite a range of options. Uh, in the early weeks of the war, a lot of people were arguing that you could somehow throw Russia out of the Security Council or out of the UN altogether. Um, more recently, there's been a slightly more nuanced debate about the need to reform the Security Council veto rules so that um, the Permanent Five cannot use their veto, as Russia has done, to block any criticism of its actions in Ukraine. And then there's a broader discussion of maybe shifting the focus of peace and security at the UN away from the Security Council towards the UN General Assembly, where all countries have the same status and no one has a veto. Um, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more of this sort of talk in the coming months and years. We know that um, even in Washington, <coughs> US officials are wondering whether they should talk more about UN reform as a way of putting Russia on the spot. But I think we shouldn't confuse the fact that people are talking about Security Council reform with the possibility that Security Council reform will happen.
Because my working assumption is that there will be a lot of talk, just as there was, in fact, after the 2003 Iraq war, but there won't be many results. Why won't there be many results? Well, firstly, you can't throw Russia out of the UN. I mean, I've looked at every single possible legal option. None of them work. You can discuss that in the Q&A, but I promise you none of them work. Um, there isn't really actually much desire amongst the P5, including the US and China, to see any limits placed on the veto, um, any real restrictions on the veto, because every country has an interest of its own in maintaining the veto. The US likes to use its veto to protect Israel. And actually, in the General Assembly, not everyone really wants to take a lead on peace and security. A lot of countries, especially countries from Africa and Latin America, have felt very, very battered and very, very exhausted by their engagement on um, Ukraine to date, and they don't really want to expose themselves to any more political <coughs> criticism. So we'll hear a lot of talk about Security Council reform, but we won't see any fundamental changes. Now, this may sound pretty depressing, and you may look at the and you may say, good God, why do you work on the UN if you see so little hope for improving the institution? Um, but I do think there are some glimmers of hope. I think there are things that we can promote in terms of strengthening multilateral cooperation and strengthening the UN that don't center on the Security Council and don't require UN charter reform. Uh, Federica is going to talk about that in the context of international accountability mechanisms. Sam, I think, is going to be talking about a number of policy areas where we can promote reform. I would just highlight three very quickly. Um, firstly, there's a lot of thinking right now in the UN about how we deal with the food crisis that is emerging um, from a combination of factors, including COVID, inflation, and the Ukrainian war. And I think there is space to set up new international cooperation mechanisms uh, to manage future food price shocks and energy price shocks better than we have managed the food price shocks coming out of Ukraine to date. And I can go into more detail about that in the Q&A. Secondly, there's a lot of interest in fighting misinformation at the UN. During COVID, we saw an enormous amount of misinformation on social media, disinformation about the pandemic. We've seen an enormous amount of disinformation about what's going on in Ukraine on social media. And very quietly, UN officials are working with organizations like Facebook to work out how they could actually respond to that disinformation in future conflicts so that you don't see social media used as a vector for hate speech. And that doesn't mean you're going to get a UN Ministry of Truth but the UN can actually provide quiet support to organizations like Facebook to try and deal with hate speech. And finally, I think in the context of the sort of general collapse of the European security order that we've seen over the last months, uh, there are UN officials who are saying that they now need to start talking more seriously than they have in recent years about arms control. That can be nuclear arms control. There's an N there's a NPT review conference coming up, in, coming up in August, but it's also creating a sort of transparency mechanisms and confidence building mechanisms that um, we will need in Europe and we will need in other regions to try and get international order back onto a stable footing after the shock of Ukraine. So those are some of the sort of hot topics in the UN building at the moment, but there are a lot of others and Sam and Federica will have smarter ideas than me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um... We should really appreciate that. Um, Sam, do you want to give us your potentially smarter ideas? <laughs> I, I definitely won't be able to do that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, thank, thank you, Rachel and, 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 and Richard. Uh, before I do, it's very self-serving, but I've been encouraged to, uh, to signal this book, uh, which is the paperback edition of the Oxford Handbook on the United Nations, which I co-edited with, with, with Tom, Tom Weiss. Uh, it came out during the pandemic, so we haven't had a chance for a launch. So this is a nice way to flag it. And most importantly, um, Richard, Richard Gowan wrote the chapter on peacekeeping in here and David Malone, uh, the rector of the UN University, who's uh, at the back there, wrote the, uh, uh, co-wrote the chapter on the UN Security Council. So um, it's got some, some fine contents, even if it's terribly edited by me. So uh, if you want a discount on it, uh, Google my name or Oxford, you'll see my email address I can send you code to get a third off, uh, particularly for the students among you. Uh, so UN reform. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is when considering UN reform, we need to think about which UN we're talking about. There are three UNs. The UN are member states that set the 
mandates and provide the resources. The UN Secretariat, headed by the Secretary General, to implement a lot of those decisions and play a key role in, in setting norms and uh, providing the data on which decisions are made. And then the whole partnership um, spectrum of NGOs, foundations, um, private sector, academia, think tanks that play a crucial role in supporting the UN and often delivering some of their objectives on the ground. So when we're talking about UN reform, which UN do we need to reform, how and why? And also on terminology, uh, reform can, can at its extreme become a bit UN bashing. UN reform is, is, is like um, a constant process, always needs reform. Uh, we wouldn't have that with domestic ministries and government that they always need reform. You talk about strengthening, upgrading and so on. So just caution about terminology. So um, implications of Ukraine for UN reform. Well, one misapprehension, which I've seen quite a lot in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, was that somehow Russia's ability to veto condemnation of the invasion in the Security Council stopped the international community from doing something. And it led to, to the great push to, to remove Russia from the Security Council, et cetera, et cetera. But if we take a step back, in fact, uh, the international community was not limited in any real respect in the assistance it could provide to Ukraine, because the UN Charter specifies that you can use force in only two occasions outside of your borders. One is if there's a Chapter 7 resolution of the Security Council, which authorizes you to do that, or in self-defense. And self-defense includes at the request of a country which is subject to an act of aggression. So in this particular case, Ukraine sought assistance from those able to, to assist, and it was completely within the rights of particularly NATO EU countries to provide whatever military assistance they wanted to do. The thing that limited that military assistance, and we're seeing it, it push the boundary of that all the time, was the de understandable desire not to have a World War III, not to escalate the conflict beyond Ukraine. Similarly on sanctions, the main limit on sanctions was not the fact that we didn't have a Security Council sanctions regime um, against Russia. It was more that uh, countries who did impose quite tough sanctions um, had limits in which they wanted to push that because uh, a complete cutoff of Russian oil and gas for Western Europe would have been um, a, a significant blow to a number of countries. So I think that's important to say, to say up front. Now, stepping back, why do we, why is it so hard to reform the UN Security Council? Uh, some of you know this already, but I'll just quickly outline the, the, the two reasons. One, the bar in the charter decided in 1945 by the draft of the charter was very high. To reform membership or voting procedures of the Security Council, you need a charter amendment. To get a charter amendment, you need an initial vote of two thirds of all the members of the UN in the General Assembly. And then you need it ratified by two thirds of the world's parliaments or governments, including, but only at that stage, including the five permanent members. Uh, the second obstacle is that that initial two thirds vote in the General Assembly hasn't been reached. There's two opposing camps, those who want new permanent members, nicknamed the G4, Brazil, India, Japan and Germany, um, and a uniting for consensus or coffee club group, as it's sometimes called, who don't want new permanent members. And both sides have been able to persuade enough countries um, to, to block any proposal from the other. So the Security Council reform negotiations began in earnest in 1993, been nicknamed the never ending working group because it's just been going on and on and on because no one at the moment can get either of those two votes. So I just want to touch. Uh, so seemingly Security Council reform is dead. Security Council reform can't go anywhere for those two reasons. But I want to think outside the box just for a minute and, and think back to when the Security Council was expanded, the only time it was expanded in the 1960s. So what happened then? Uh, there was a vote in 63, the, all the ratifications were achieved by, by August 65, it expanded from 11 members to 15 members. 
It seemed pretty innocuous, but it actually changed the whole balance of the council. Developing countries generally had a majority uh, for the first time. So what actually happened? Well, there was a bit of blackmail going on, going on in the late 50s, early 60s. Understandable blackmail, because most countries from Africa and Asia were disenfranchised. The, the uh, six non-permanent members of the Security Council were elected according to a secret gentleman's agreement, as it was called, from 1945, which allocated seats for Latin America, for Western Europe, one for Eastern Europe, and for the, for the British Commonwealth. So a lot of countries were, were disenfranchised. So they began to refuse to elect Western and, and other members to the, to the Security Council. And instead, you've got a standoff. You need two thirds of the members, a two thirds majority to elect a member of the Security Council. You've got a standoff throughout the late 50s and early 60s, whereby eventually, country from the north, the country from the global south, agreed to share a seat for a year each. They're two year seats normally. So it was a really interesting example of where the General Assembly rebelled. And, and that was one of the factors. But the other factor, which perhaps has per, uh, uh, pertinence, is that behind the scenes, um, Russia was saying, we object to Security Council reform until the communist Chinese have their rightful place on the Security Council. That time in the 60s, the nationalists based in, in Taiwan, Chinese Taipei, was still um, uh, uh, occupied the seat. Uh, and at the last minute, the Chinese communists let it be known that they weren't, they, that they, they weren't going to stand in the way of greater developing country representation. So suddenly Russia was on the back foot and the West, or the Soviet Union as it was then, and the West relying on the Soviet Union always opposing this were also pushed, put on the back foot. So I just wonder possibly some point in the future um, whether China will look at its friends in the, in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and think perhaps there's a developing country first solution. Perhaps um, we can engineer a, a, a vote in the General Assembly that, that puts Africa first and perhaps a seat for India and Brazil as part of the reconfiguration of international relations where India is really sitting in between China and, uh, and the West and a lot of these, these minilaterals. So I'm just, it's a bit way out, but I just wanted to, to it's a reminder that things can change and, and actually the positions of individual countries, we think that there's complete deadlock, but perhaps um, that's what happened. So I just want to, we've got limited time, so just going to touch on a few things and we can elaborate them in, in, uh, in the Q&A. The first is, in the absence of Security Council reform, it raises the profile of these mini laterals. Uh, um, so they are um, talking about informal uh, constellations of member states that meet without a treaty based structure, without a permanent secretariat. So, so the, the G20 has become a particularly significant one because the G20 members are most um, in, in the most um, um, uh, uh, got the most amount of G 85% of the world's GDP, about 80% 80, 80 of greenhouse gas emissions come from those countries, about 80% of world trade come from those, those countries. So you've got a lot of powerful countries, including the EU as, as an institution, seated at a table in a constellation of heads of state finance ministers where it's easier to make decisions. So the Security Council has a rival in the G20, even though the G20 primarily looks at economic and social matters. So part of UN reform, I think, is going to be how the UN uh, interacts with these bodies of limited membership. The lot of China-centered one, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the, the BRICS, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and, and then uh, you've got the EU or regional organizations, AU as well in the mix. Innovative multilateralism. We saw the Paris Agreement that there's not much appetite in the recent years for top down new treaties, but actually there's a lot of appetite for innovation. So Paris Agreement had uh, bottom up national commitments towards climate change with with a kind of top top down um, a rising ambition as technology or political will allow. So I think all, all eyes should be on the high level advisory board on effective multilateralism. Uh, being very, very well ably um, supported by the UN University's Center for Policy Research in New York. They've been given a mandate 
by Guterres, by the Secretary General, to come up with um, a prognosis about what are the blocks to effective multilateralism and what are some of the solutions. And that will feed into a summit of the future in 2023. Um, the, the other sign, the other opportunity for UN reform, I think, is in the greater integration of the economic and social dimension and the peace and security dimension. One of the, the, the great, the, the, the great um, sadnesses of, of Ukraine has been not just the violence inflicted in that country, but the wider effects, um, the food and fuel crisis that has been inflicted on, 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 on parts of Africa, um, because uh, Russia and Ukraine were the breadbasket of the, uh, of the world. The effect on detracting attention from climate change, the, the stalling of progress on the sustainable development goals that need to be achieved by 2030. So the UN has traditionally had a blind spot when it comes to the political economy of conflict. And I think the, the international community is recognizing more and more that you, you can't separate the peace and security pillars from the economic and social, even though the charter approaches peace and security very much through a, a, a sort of a, a, a political lens and a, and a kinetic violence lens, not the wider uh, the wider context, but we can talk more about that. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to say something about technology. Antonio Guterres is the first Secretary General with a science and engineering background. And he's been doing what he can within his scope to increase the use of um, technology, including big data, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, both to do things cheaper and more effectively, but also the, the, the role that the UN will play in in, in creating new norms in these areas like um, um, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous weapons, and, and so on. So I think there's real scope, we'll talk about this more in the Q&A, for um, greater accountability through the use of, for example, satellites, ground sensors. You can now um, know exactly what emissions are coming from every power station in the world in real time. You know exactly the pattern of deforestation in real time. You know the, through a, a EU Google uh, collaboration with the UN Environmental Programme, we know exactly how much fresh water exists on this planet and that connects to biodiversity in real time. Governments can't say, no, the data's not that, you know, this is, this is the reality. We've got an external way of checking. That is potentially transformative in ways that citizens, um, uh, academics <laughs> and think tanks can hold uh, governments to account. Uh, across these areas. So I think I've gone over my 12 minutes, but uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, I pass it over to you, Federica. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and good evening, everyone. It's an enormous privilege to uh, be part of this discussion with uh, Richard and Sam, both of whom I um, deeply admire. And I'm sorry that I can't not be there in person today, but I'm grateful to the organizers for accommodating uh, my remote participation. Um, it's hard to come last when the uh, conversation has already been uh, so rich, but what I uh, think I wanted to use my time uh, doing is talking a little bit about a limited uh, um, scope area for reform that seems both necessary but also maybe possible at the UN around accountability for mass atrocity issues. Um, and that's because together with uh, my research team at, at ELAC, uh, we have been doing quite some thinking around this. Uh, and in fact, we recently published uh, on May 19, the report uh, that I will also plug. I don't have it physically with me, but it's called Anchoring Accountability for Mass Atrocities, the Permanent Support Needed to Fulfill UN Investigative Mandates. That uh, It's available on our website and we can also circulate it if, if it's of interest to you. Um, but before I get to talk about what that report says and what our reform for proposal entails, I want to briefly outline some of the th trends and working assumptions that guided our approach and research, um, some of which echo uh, some of what's already been said. Uh, the first is that while Ukraine might prove to be a watershed moment in some way uh, and, and allow some breakthrough, um, if not in the core, but at least around discussions on UN uh, reform and how to uh, bolster and strengthen the overall multilateral system. Uh, the issues that this crisis has brought to light uh, so virulently um, um, have been in the making for quite some time. And particularly in our work, we uh, 
kind of looked at, we identified 2011 as uh, the year around which things started to take a sharp turn, in particular uh, when it comes to the breaking down of uh, UN Security Council cooperation on issues of uh, justice, accountability, and of course, uh, more broadly, uh, mass atrocity response. Um, Lots of things obviously happened in 2011, but uh, a couple of them that I think had a direct effect on the uh, dynamics that we're seeing today were, of course, the military intervention in Libya and Cote d'Ivoire and the uh, um, outbreak of the Syrian civil war. Um, seeing what had happened to Gaddafi and Gbagbo as a result of these military interventions that had been in some way framed uh, in humanitarian terms. Of course, uh, Putin was not going to let uh, his ally in Syria, Bashar al-Assad, to be met with the same fate. So Russia began uh, its effective stalling of the UN Security Council to prevent any meaningful action in Syria, uh, vetoing what are to this day, if, if, if I count correctly, 16 resolutions. Uh, but the truth is that both Russia and China had been opposing for a long time the seizing of UN Security Council uh, on mass atrocity issues. Uh, and, in, and this includes also the um, uh, leveraging of the uh, Security Council powers to uh, open up accountability um, um, avenues for mass violence. Um, but the, I think that the, uh, what these events in 2011 allowed um, uh, those that opposed that course of action to do was to kind of draw a line without appearing uh, disingenuous of face value. Um, another interesting and in some ways diametrically opposed trend that we start to see around then, which uh, Richard also briefly touched upon, is, and, and I think that this speaks both to the veto fatigue in some ways that the broader UN membership uh, might be feeling, but also um, I think speaks to the ongoing demands for justice that um, the very communities that are affected by this violence are, are putting, are setting to the fore, is that as soon as the UN Security Council uh, shut down around mass atrocity and accountability uh, issues in response, we started to see a migration of action to other UN bodies, including the uh, General Assembly, but initially it really was, insofar as this area of work is concerned, it was the Human Rights Council. Uh, in my work about uh, on the Council, Human Rights Council, I've called this an accountability turn in the UN human rights system. Uh, that's because since accountability mandates could no longer come from the Security Council, where they've traditionally mostly been emanating from, states began to leverage the existing UN human rights system to try and set the stage for judicial accountability, essentially asking what were traditionally human rights probes to investigate atrocities to a judicial, including criminal standard. Um, something that they it's, they were not equipped to do, and arguably, uh, with a few notable exceptions that I will discuss, uh, still aren't. Um, I won't bore you with the technicalities here, but essentially what UN human rights investigations are being asked to do today is to perform functions that can be conceptualized as pre-prosecutorial in nature, in that they're no longer simply asked to carry out fact-finding and report publicly on these findings, chiefly to uh, prompt political accountability, but also, and this is the important uh, thing to note to identify culpable parties, including individual perpetrators, and to gather and preserve um, evidence of their culpability so that if at some later uh, day prosecutions do become viable, the evidence is there to support uh, criminal and justice processes. And this is a huge departure from the way uh, things had traditionally been done. And uh, um, the, sh the shift is very important because it calls into question uh, some assumptions and, 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 and big issues around um, internal international authority and responsibility for the enforcement and maintenance of international peace and security, which I think are not entirely resolved and have their bearing on the conversation we're having and that others are having around uh, UN reform. Um, there's also been some technical arguments put forward about the viability of some of these investigations, which in many cases are asked to do something that it's not in their DNA and for which proper resources are not uh, being provided. Um, and the merits, in fact, of these technical arguments, I think, can be seen by looking at the performance of the three UN independent investigative mechanisms that were set up by the, by the General Assembly, the UN Security Council and the Human Rights Council, respectively, for uh, Syria, ISIL, Daesh, where um, some uh, cooperation was possible because of the counterterrorism lens, and Myanmar, starting with 2015-16. 
Um, by and large, these three mandates have been given the expertise, infrastructure, and resources that are needed to uh, carry out this type of perpetrator-focused investigation, um, which is what our report and work ultimately looks at to say if we're serious about wanting UN mandates to perform this accountability function, and to me it seems that we are because since 2011 we've counted in all but four of the probes that have been set up by the Human Rights Council in situations of ongoing violence where allegations of mass atrocities have been advanced. And this includes, by the way, the most recent uh, mandates, such as the ones for Belarus and Ukraine. It seems that these requirements are here to stay. Um, but importantly, when you look at the demands for justice, again, coming from the affected communities, which have been a main driver of this accountability turn, and when you look at the fact that in the uh, 25, 30 years that the, the international criminal justice uh, has been revived as a, as a tool for responding to um, mass atrocities uh, scenario, um, the main challenges that have been faced uh, by those that have been trying to mount um, criminal prosecutions have really been at the evidentiary level. So um, it seems that there are good grounds to ask what should and especially what can be done given the political context we're operating within uh, in terms of uh, supporting these entities in performing this work. Um, so in our research, uh, briefly outlined, we looked at the challenges that these accountability mandates uh, face at various stages of their operation, starting with their sta um, uh, startup phase and deployment, um, in terms of you know the budgeting, uh, expert recruitments, and operational challenges that they encounter, um, but also how they had to adjust their methodology and what type of resources and expertise uh, it's, uh, are needed, including you know things like ballistic expertise, forensic expertise, legal expertise, um, and even uh, digital uh, open source and AI, AI expertise um, to uh, that are needed to incorporate forensic and criminal standards into their investigations, but also how they collect the and process the information how they analyze it, how they archive it, uh, what type of infrastructures and security they need to protect this information from breaches, and how this information is then used, given that in most cases, these mandates are conferred where there is a, an accountability, um, an institutional vacuum, meaning that uh, the ICC, for example, is in, uh, competent, doesn't have jurisdiction, the Security Council, of course, won't refer the situation, and uh, universal jurisdiction doesn't appear to be Im immediately applicable. So um, what we concluded is that the system as a whole currently is ineffective and inefficient when it comes to delivering accountability. Um, many reasons for that. Uh, mandates uh, are often created as a, as a palliative for action um, and intentionally not given the resources to do the job because states want to be seen as doing something, but they don't really want these mandates to be effective. Uh, in other contexts, mandates are created and given the resources, but because of the current approaches to funding, um, the door is open to undue political influence in some cases. And um, it, there's also the issue of selectivity because in some cases mandates are created and others are not. So how do we justify uh, these double standards? Um, but in all of the cases that we uh, analyzed and looked at, um, it, it seemed that all mandates, especially in the initial phases of their operations, were um, essentially forced to reinvent the wheel each time because the different parts of the UN were in sync or because there have been lacunas in the retention of institutional memory, for example, or the standardization of uh, best practices. Um, so what we conclude is that, um, and this is our proposal for moderate UN reform around this issue, is that centralizing some of the support functions and infrastructure uh, that um, enables these investigations to uh, be carried out uh, made sense. Um, and so that when mandates are conferred, they can deploy quickly and effectively, um, but also so that the investment that has already been made in state-of-the-art infrastructure and technical expertise goes to the benefit of all, not just some. And maybe this would be a way to help balancing out some of the political, uh, politically motivated asymmetries that states often intentionally bake into these sorts of investigations. And also because um, doing so would enable the overall system to become more resilient, uh, harder to misappropriate and, and to attack with, um, those that, are, um, that do, do not want to see accountability to be delivered. Um, so what we propose is the establishment of what we call an investigation support mechanism, which essentially would have the same resources, infrastructure, and technical expertise similar to uh, those possessed by the three highly successful UN investigative uh, mandates uh, for Sierra Myanmar and ISIL-Daesh that I uh, touched upon earlier. Um, and 
this entity would in fact build on a lot of the investment, both financial and in terms of efficiency and, and, and effectiveness and best practices, there's already been achieved by these other three mandates so that when future probes are set up by the Human Rights Council or by another competent UN body, um, the conditions are there to do things right uh, from the start. Um, and so that um, even if it remains immediately unclear uh, or it will remain for some time unclear um, who might ultimately exercise jurisdiction over these perpetrators, at least we preserve and protect the evidence uh, so that it's not lost or compromised. And this is important because although, and I'm a very strong believer of this, ultimately it is for each community to choose which forms of justice uh, is most appropriate to their circumstances. The reality is that if we were to choose judicial accountability and particularly uh, criminal accountability as one of the uh, tools that deploy as part of the transitional justice strategies, unless the evidence is there and has been properly collected and preserved, um, this um, um, avenue will be precluded for, from them. Um, so I think, and my I think my research team agrees with me, that we have a duty, if not at least a moral obligation as the international community to help these communities uh, keep all pathways to justice open, if any other reason, because it, they're asking for help in this regard. Um, there was another point I wanted to raise in terms of uh, why our proposal for the reform is somewhat moderate when compared to maybe some more ambitious uh, proposals that could have been made, and also why we chose to decouple the question of building itself the capacity to do this, which is a technical question at the core of our uh, proposal for reform, from the issue of who gets to decide which crisis should be investigated by this body, which is ultimately a political question for states to decide on. Uh, but I think I can expand on that um, or anything else that um, is of interest in the Q&A. So I think I'll, I'll conclude here and uh, looking forward to your question and continuing our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we can give all of our speakers a round of applause.